Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about describing the distribution of some sort of quantitative variable. Right? So we're we're at the point where maybe you've made some sort of visual representation, some sort of graph, um, some sort of chart table, and that's great, but we need to know, okay, what can we take away from that? How do we describe this? Okay, so we're going to put that some of that terminology in place. All right, so when I'm trying to, when I have a quantitative distribution, or another way we can say it is numerical, um, when I have one of these distributions, what should I be thinking about? Well, the key aspects can be summarized by this kind of silly little acronym, SOX. All right, so SOX stands for shape, outliers, center, and spread. So whenever I'm describing something, if I hit on those four things, I should be in good shape. All right, the first two things are things that we can most of the time easily see visually. Right, the shape is a really big visual component. That's the main component um, of our, our visual interpretation. Right, and potential outliers or anything that sticks out to us visually are something we can note as well. Now, center and spread, we can kind of estimate center and spread visually, right? But these are really more numerical measure type things that we'll talk about in the future. Okay, but the main thing we want to focus on here visually is shape. So when I'm thinking about shape, I first want to answer, is my distribution symmetric or is it skewed? Right now, if things are symmetric, there's two main shapes I want to be able to recognize. Uniform distribution and kind of that bell-shaped distribution. Okay, so those are important symmetric distributions. We'll see other ones, but those are probably the two most used, at least at this point. If it's not symmetric, it's skewed, and I need to be able to recognize the direction of the skewness. Is it left skewed? Is it right skewed? Right, I also, then, once I've established skewness, symmetric, I then need to note its modality. All right. So let's look at some of these symmetric shapes first. Let's look at uniform shape. Uniform shape, as it might sound, means everything's even across the board. Right? Each potential value of this variable occurs with the same frequency. So if you imagine a histogram of a uniform distribution, it's not very exciting. Right, it's just kind of flat, just a straight rectangle looking deal. Okay, a bell shaped distribution. You've probably seen or heard of this idea before. This is where most of our values tend to concentrate in the middle, but as we go off to the left or we go off to the right, right things go in either direction pretty evenly. Right? We've got a few values to the left, a few values to the right but they balance each other out, right? That's the big point there. Bell-shaped distribution balances each other out. This distribution is really important to us because for whatever reason, it, it tends to just show up in nature about a lot of things. People, animals, plants, whatever it is. We tend to see this kind of bell-shaped distribution. All right, so uniform and bell-shaped are the two big symmetric distributions that we're interested in. What about skewed distributions? Well, we need to know if it's left or right skewed. So what does right skewed look like? We talk about the skewness in the direction of those extreme values, those potential outliers, or what we'll see on a graph as a long tail. All right, so a right skewed distribution, we have most of our data over here on the left, but we see that tail extend to the right. So we describe our skewness in the direction of the tail. A left skewed distribution is where our tail extends to the left. All right, so our extreme values, our potential outliers, maybe would be over here to the left. Okay, so once we've established that it's symmetric, is it skewed? We then move on to modality. All right, modality has that word, that root word, mode in. Okay, so we know what the mode is, right? The, the kind of elementary definition of a mode 
is the most frequently occurring value in your data set, and that's useful for categorical data. But with quantitative data, especially if we have very precisely collected quantitative data, okay, the, there may not even be a repeated value. All right? We think of our mode more as where do we see kind of clustering, right? Clustering would be indicated on a histogram by mounds in that histogram. Right? A lot of data only has kind of one mound, one area that it seems to be clustering. That's what we would call a unimodal distribution, one mode. Some data may have kind of two clusters to it. You might call that bimodal, three mounds, trimodal. From there on, we, we can just say multimodal. So notice, modality is completely separate from whether it is symmetric or skewed. Right, so for example, this is a symmetric unimodal distribution. But some of the examples we saw before, right, we saw skewed unimodal distributions, right? Like something like this. This is left skewed, but it's still unimodal. Okay, so just remember, and, and you could have something that looks like, say, your graph looked like this. It's bimodal, right, but it's also symmetric. You could have trimodal symmetric, whatever. So the modality is separate from whether it's symmetric or skewed. Okay, now notice, like in this last example, yes, we had one, we had one large mode, we had one smaller mode, but your mounds can be different heights. Right? If we see clustering in two different areas, that means there is something going on. And most likely, it, it tells us there's some sort of groupings that some sort of maybe lurking variable, confounding variable like we've talked before, that exists there that's creating this effect. Right? Once we've isolated that effect, it may be more useful to figure out what that effect is and separate those groups into separate graphs. All right, so what are some things that could cause that? Well, maybe you could think of a graph that would end up being bimodal or multimodal. Um, lots of times, things, something that could end up bimodal would be where we're graphing things like men's and women's heights or men's and women's weights, something like that. Right? Men and women have different average heights. So if I graphed enough people, Maybe I would see some sort of clustering around women's average height and some sort of clustering around men's average height. Right? I might see two different distributions there. Or sales at a restaurant over the course of the day, afternoon and evening, or extend it to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right? You could see some kind of trimodal effect going on there. All right, so shape is really important to us. It has to do with its symmetric or skewed and its modality. The other thing that we can see visually often are potential outliers. Right? And you've probably heard this word before. It just means something that sticks out, something really big, something really small that doesn't really fit the rest of the pattern of our data. All right, we've already seen in all of our different graphical methods, some graphical methods may be better to view outliers than others. Now we're really focusing on histograms here. As histograms are our most commonly used one, and histograms, since shape is the biggest visual aspect that we want to note, right, histograms are probably our most widely used, most commonly used visual method. And sometimes extreme outliers, something like this, can show up on a histogram. Right? So this is the weight of, of people. And we've got most of our people over here, and then we have somebody over here at 1,200 pounds. Right, so unless somebody accidentally weighed a, a elephant or something like that, okay, we this is probably some sort of outlier, some sort of mistake. It was probably, you know, a hundred and twenty pound person, right, that they had an extra zero to or something like that. Okay, but some histograms, if you'll recall the high temperature data set that we've been working with, right, we saw this this kind of bell shape. But we also saw this out here, right? And if I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, maybe I see a little bit of right skewness, 
maybe there's something going on out here. Now remember in the dot plot of that same data, it was more apparent that yes, this point seems to stick out over here. Right? This looks like it's at 134 degrees. I believe that was in California. All right, so outliers, histogram is, sometimes we can see them on a histogram, but histogram may not be your best tool to see outliers. Now for now, we're just kind of visually looking for outliers. We may, what do we do with them? Well, we might want to report them. They could be a typo, or they might just be something worth looking into. Okay, we'll see in the future, if I'm kind of on the fence about a point like this, I'm like, well, it, it sticks out in my dot plot, but my histogram looks okay. It's not as obvious as something like this. If I'm sort of on the fence of whether I want to deem something an outlier or not, we'll see numerical methods in the future that we can exactly identify outliers with. All right, so moving through socks, shape, outliers, now just talking about center and spread. We're really just focusing on visual aspects right now, but you can, from a graph, usually sort of visually or roughly estimate the center. Remember we define our center as our most typical value. Okay, I want to note that here because if we have multiple modes, like for example, for example, what if I had a graph that was bimodal, right, and looked like this. Maybe this is 20 and this is, say, 40. All right, some people might report 30, and that would be, you know, if you're calculating, say, the average of this data set, it'd probably come out to about 30. Some people might want to report that as the center. But that's not a good representation of the data. All right? We would run a report, it's bimodal, a typical value at about 20 and 40. Okay, so modality can have some effect on how we report the center. And visually, spread wise, we can kind of note, oh, it looks really spread out. Our range looks large. We know how to calculate the range, right? Max, minus, minimum. But this is about as far as we can go with center and spread visually. We'll see numerical methods to describe center and spread a little bit later. All right, so those are the big things about how we visually describe a quantitative distribution. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.